I'd like to introduce the, the next session. The, the next session is entitled Creating a National Network for Everyday Pandemic Level Preparedness. As a part of our theme of advocacy, activism, and leadership, we recognize that such things as the pandemic or another natural disaster would challenge the infrastructure of this country, as well as to challenge uh, those of us who provide care. I am excited that we had an opportunity to put together a remarkable group of leaders in this field who are working to improve uh, that infrastructure completely. Um, now I would like to offer a warm welcome to my colleagues, Drs. Dingledine, Jensen, Newton, Masias, and Fallot. I've asked them to present the Robert E. Gross Disaster Preparedness Award. As I mentioned, advocacy in pediatric surgery can take many forms. The world of trauma and disaster preparation and management is particularly well suited for the intersection of individualized surgical care and the development of advanced prevention and treatment systems. Pediatric surgeons are experts in caring for injured children. It is fundamental to our profession. Beyond, uh, uh, beyond caring for the single patient, we know that trauma systems include ensuring community hospitals are prepared to treat sick children, and they are essential in this process. I would like to welcome our group. Thank you so much for doing this, uh, and uh, delighted to hear your comments. Before you start, I'll just walk, but you have to head to the airport to shake your hand. <laughs> to tell you, thank you, I'm sorry that I have to run, but thank you so much. Great. Son's graduating tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, uh, it's a little humbling to follow uh, Dr. Barksdale's talk. <laughs> but it's going to be fantastic. My name is Mike Dingledine. I uh, am a pediatric surgeon. I'm honored to say that uh, Dr. Barksdale is one of my mentors, one of my partners at work, and and a friend. Um, and we're also honored that he invited us to speak today and speak to you about a topic that we're all passionate about, right? It's improving the care of injured children. So our talk today, our symposium, I'm just the moderator and doing some quick intros and laying the foundation for what the rest of the group is speaking. Our title is Creating a National Network for Everyday and Pandemic Level Pediatric Preparedness. Aaron Jensen is going to be talking kind of about the history of the EMSC and the EIC, and he'll go into more about that, which will then phase into Chris Newton talking about pediatric disaster centers of excellence and expanding out this individualized care. Dr. Macias will be talking about the new program in the Pediatric Pandemic Network, and Mary Fallett will be talking about um, Network of Networks and APSA and the pediatric surgery role. So why are we even talking about this? Why did we get invited to speak? Well. Um, these are all stats that you know. This is, right, this is showing that what's the number one source of morbidity and mortality in children and adolescents in this country? It's injuries, right? It's the motor vehicle collisions, the firearm injuries, suffocations, drownings, et cetera. We've been talking about this recently a lot. This is from the same New England Journal paper that, uh, that Ed was just presenting in his last talk, but showing that firearms are now leading cause over mute motor vehicle collisions. What can we really do to improve these numbers, right? These are hard things to, to accomplish. How do we, what is the actual quality improvement around this? As we know, this is the kind of population base of the U.S. There's big swaths of the U.S. that don't have quality access to care. 2007, the Institute of Medicine report shows only about 6% of, of emergency rooms in general are prepared for pediatric resuscitation, only 6%. six percent. It's gotten better since over seven, but still not great. This problem was recognized early, right? And part of the, the attempt to correct this problem was the development of the EMSC system in the, in the mid 80s. Um, which moved into projects like Pediatric Ready, the National Pediatric Readiness Project, now being recognized even by the ACS and the Committee on Trauma as essential to having a trauma program. You have to be able to be prepared to treat a sick child. 
So why are we talking about this? What does this have to also do with disaster management and preparedness? Well, I know it's kind of hard to read this slide from far away, but this is the increase in natural disasters throughout the world, right, since 1970. Huge increase in numbers that we've seen. So are you going to be affected by a disaster? Are children be affected? Yes. But not just the natural disasters, right? Stats like this, 1,300 school shootings since, since 1970, 18% of those have been since Sandy Hook. Cyber incidents are only going to be increasing. Why do I lump this in with disaster management? Because you have to be prepared to have your IT systems taken down, and that's going to impact your ability to take care of patients. And of course, the pandemic that we've been dealing with the last two years, right? Over a million deaths now. How do we tackle such a tough problem of making sure that we have equitable uh, care for injured children across the United States? It has to be with collaboration. It has to be not just the pediatric surgeon speaking, but a large number of different specialties and a large group. It's all of us coming together to be able to tackle this tough problem. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn it over to, to Aaron Jensen to go next. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just echo everybody else's sentiments about how great it is to be back in person and, and see all of you guys. Um, I've been asked today to speak about the EMSC Innovation Improvement Center um, and our efforts around quality improvement in trauma care, but, but mostly efforts related to pediatric preparedness and emergency preparedness. And I'll put this in the context of trauma because I think that's a disease that most of us take care of on a regular basis. I don't have any disclosures. I will acknowledge some uh, federal support and uh, the opinions I present today are my own, not those of the federal government. This is the point of my entire talk, and I think this is the point of a lot of disaster preparedness. If you can't take care of a kid on a random Tuesday morning or a routine Tuesday morning, you're certainly not going to be able to take care of them during a disaster when your normal resources are limited. And if we really focus on preparing centers to take care of kids on a routine Tuesday morning, we will elevate the level of preparedness for when the disaster actually hits. And that's really the summary of what I'm going to talk about for the next 15 minutes, but I'll put some data behind why we're doing that and uh, some examples. And this is what we do. I would suspect that most of us as pediatric, uh, pediatric surgeons um, practice in either pediatric trauma centers or high-level pediatric centers. Uh, this is my center. We're verified by the ACS. We participate in pediatric TQIP, and we're hypervigilant about preparedness for injury care. We're hypervigilant about quality. We want to make sure that we have everything we need to save lives when lives need to be saved. There's a couple of cases I'll present. I've obscured his identity because he was a victim of a violent crime. This kid was w literally walking down the street and was a case of mistaken identity and was stabbed several times. And the people who stabbed him said, oh, no, it's not him, it's not him, and then ran away. Well, he came into our trauma center in profound shock with a hole in his aorta from that knife. Uh, we quickly recognized that there's a problem and got him to the operating room quickly and saved his life. He got a super massive transfusion, multiple operations, but went home completely intact with no functional impairments. There are certainly some long-term psychologic uh, issues that we're helping him deal with, but physically he walked out uh, with no impairments. Many of you have probably taken care of a kid like this. This is not him, this is a Google picture, but uh, a young boy who was a pitcher who was hit in the head with a line drive whose parents brought him to our ER in a private car, so we had no pre-hospital notification. He walked into triage. We quickly recognized there was a problem, activated our internal trauma system, got him intubated, got some neuroprotective agents, and off to CT in the OR, and got his epidural evacuated within 45 minutes, and three days later went home, again, with no cognitive deficits. This is what we do at pediatric trauma centers. We are prepared to save lives like this. But not every kid comes to a center like mine or a center like yours. This is where I live. Welcome to California. And uh, I'd like to thank all of my friends who uh, gave me plenty of chuckles this week when they asked if I drove down for the meeting. Um, so those people who are, are not familiar with how big California is, that's a nine hour drive. This is a really big state, okay? Um, so no, I flew. Um, but more importantly, I'd like to draw your attention to the top of this map. So my center is one of those blue centers in the Bay Area. It's a five-hour drive to the Northern California border, and it's 310 miles. This is a large area where there are no pediatric trauma centers. And I'll point out that the big blue dot and the big red dot, that's part of the legend. Those aren't actually pediatric trauma centers. And there's no centers in Southern Oregon. There's no centers in Northern Nevada. There's nothing up there. And there are a lot of kids that live up there in this 
region of the red box. And I get a lot of kids from up there. So what happens when you get injured up there as a child? Uh, this is not my patient. There's a picture from Google, but it's highly representative of what happened on this. Again, it was a Tuesday that this occurred. A very small 11 kilo four-year-old was visiting his grandfather's ranch with his father. And uh, his dad decided to take him on a ride in the tractor. He put him in the bucket in the front and they were driving around grandpa's ranch and the child fell out of the tractor and the, the dad didn't realize that and the tractor ran over him. They were so far away from any hospital, when they called 911, the dispatcher said, okay, well, I need you to drive down the country road and meet an ambulance at this intersection. So they drove 20 minutes in their private car with an obtundant, unresponsive child, where they met EMS on an old country road, where they couldn't establish any IV or IO access or get an airway, and they drove another 20 minutes to the Level 3 Trauma Center in rural <coughs> Northern California, which fortunately has a helipad, and once you're on the helicopter, it's about a 45 minute, maybe one hour flight to our center but they're already 40 minutes in from the injury. And this is what rural Northern California looks like. We have two adult level two trauma centers along the I-5 and everything else is a level three or a level four. But these are the centers that I would argue we need to be focusing our quality improvement efforts on. This is where the greatest opportunity for us to make a difference is. Because a lot of kids, most kids come through these centers and not directly to our centers. I do an 80% transfer volume for my, my most highest severe injury patients. So they're going to adult trauma centers first. And this is where we need to improve quality. This is the next frontier. This is uh, not just a California problem. This is Mike Nance's data from about 10 years ago. And you can see all that white space in the country. That's where kids are outside of 60 minutes of a pediatric trauma center. Some newer data from the um, Governmental Accountability Office shows that only 57% of kids in the country live within 30 miles of a pediatric trauma center. However, 88% of kids live within 30 miles of a high-level adult trauma center. And we can really improve coverage if we can optimize pediatric care, at least the initial resuscitative care, at these adult trauma centers that don't routinely take care of kids. And these are the centers that are really the focus of the EIIC and the trauma domain and where we think we can have the greatest impact in terms of emergency preparedness and pediatric readiness and the ability to help children. So I'd like to ask everybody here, the centers that are referring you patients, are they ready to resuscitate and initially stabilize a child? Think about this child that I presented in this case. Are the centers that send you patients ready to save that life or keep them alive long enough to get to you? Well, this kid was taken to the level three trauma center. You can see that he's in profound shock. They can't get a blood pressure. Um, he was intubated with an ET tube that was way too big for his size. They did get central venous access. His hematocrit was 11, not his hemoglobin. His hematocrit was 11. So thank goodness they activated the massive transfusion protocol, which is an adult MTP. And we'll talk more about that in the next slide. And they gave him a unit of blood. And an adult trauma patient, if you give them a unit of blood and their blood pressure responds, you label them. A responder, right? Okay, unit of blood, they did okay. Well, in a kid who's only 11 kilos, that's like giving him five units of blood, right? But because he got a unit of blood, they said, okay, he's a responder, we'll send him off to CT and we'll get a scan. Um, fortunately, he survived the CT. Um, that is not his stomach, that's his malperfused spleen with a ton of arterial extravasation, okay? Um, so, not surprisingly, when he got back from the scanner, he became hypotensive again and was way too unstable to put on the helicopter. Uh, the trauma surgeon on the call that day happened to be the adult colorectal surgeon uh, who was willing to do a laparotomy, pack his liver, and take his spleen out. I, I want to be very clear. I am not criticizing this level three trauma center. They saved this kid's life, okay? And it is centers like this that are the initial stop for most kids with severe injuries in, in, outside of our metropolitan areas. But when he got transfused in the operating room, and he got a perfect protocol transfusion per their adult MTP. You start with four reds, and then you go one to one to one. Well, by the time you get you know, the first seven units in, you're already two blood volumes in, in a kid this size. So he's a seven to one to one ratio, um, which is a very unbalanced, super massive transfusion. And by the time he got to the pediatric trauma center, you can see that his hematocrit is now 75, but he has profound coagulopathy as a result of this unbalanced transfusion that quite frankly was done by the book for their adult massive transfusion protocol. So lots of room for improvement here had they just had a pediatric MTP that they could have activated and followed. He had a lot of complications from this over resuscitation. He had ARDS, transfusion associated lung injury, spent a long time on the ventilator, got subglottic stenosis, had to go to the OR twice to get that dilated. 60 days later, he did go to, the, go to rehab. 
And this is his picture when he went home. He went home again with no functional deficits. Okay, so again, that level three center saved his life. But we could have saved him a lot of morbidity if we could have optimized that initial resuscitation, particularly the ET tube size and the massive transfusion. So was this adult trauma center prepared on this Tuesday morning, or actually Tuesday afternoon, to resuscitate this kid? I, I would argue they weren't. Um, they didn't know what size um, ET tube to place. They did an age-based calculation, but didn't really realize he was a really small four-year-old. Um, they weren't prepared for massive transfusion. And upon follow-up with them, we realized they did not have a pediatric-specific TBI resuscitation protocol. So kids who would come in with severe head injuries, they were not ready to take care of. We've provided them that protocol. But getting these things in place can help prepare these centers to provide that initial resuscitation. So how do we help these centers? Mike introduced this concept before. This is pediatric readiness, which can be broken down into six domains. I won't go through all of them. Um, but centers have to have the right equipment. They have to have all the sizes of ET tubes and chest tubes that are necessary. And they have to know how to select the right size and use all of this equipment. They have to know how to do weight-based dosing. Coordination of care mostly for us refers to coordination with the pediatric trauma center to get advice, but also to have rapid transfer protocols out to get the air transport assets that can carry a kid activated rapidly. Policies and procedures. How simple would it have been for my pediatric trauma center to have reached out a couple of months prior to this injury and given my pediatric massive transfusion protocol to this center that sends me patients all the time, okay? We can, we can help, we can do all of this stuff. So um, the EMSC Innovation Improvement Center was established in 2016. I had the pleasure of joining the team in uh, 2020 when the trauma domain was implemented. The focus of the EIIC is to optimize care for, or optimize outcomes for children across the entirety of the emergency care spectrum. Not to create new systems, not to focus on our pediatric trauma centers, but to focus on where kids get care. And most of them get their initial care outside of our centers. This is a very complicated schematic. And I put this up just to show this is a very complicated center. We, we have a bunch of those blue boxes that might look like silos, but we describe this as a team of teams. Okay, we are focusing on our, our silo, but this is an interconnected collaborative network where we have problems that span domains, we work together. And those gray cross-cutting domains really facilitate the implementation of the things that we want to work with. So I'm focusing on the, the trauma domain today, but pediatric readiness is so much bigger than trauma. It's all of pediatric emergency care, from the pre-hospital to the hospital and to the transfers and all of that. I have a picture of the leadership team, including Dr. Macias here today. Uh, this, is, this is really a profound group of people that are just trying to help improve the outcomes for kids. Within our trauma domain, um, Mike Dingledean and I, along with Lisa Gray, who couldn't be here today, co-lead this domain. We have a, a huge investment from partner organizations. We have program support from Emergency Nurses Association, ACS Committee on Trauma, American College of Emergency Physicians, and we have buy-in from a number of stakeholder organizations. One of the first things that we did with all of these stakeholders was to get them in a room and go through a Delphi process to figure out what should we focus on first. There are so many things we need to fix in pediatric trauma, and what are the, what's the low-hanging fruit and the most important things to work on? The number one thing was pediatric emergency care coordinators in adult trauma centers. And how do we get boots on the ground champions in each adult trauma center? How do we get easy to use image guidelines out there? We need better toolkits, tools to be used in real time by adult trauma providers that need to resuscitate a kid. And then we need to teach them how to use those tools. And finally, we need minimum standards uh, for kids. So the first priority was addressing this pediatric emergency care coordinator. Mike pointed out that the new ACS standards and the gray book that was just released state that all trauma centers, including those that don't take care of kids, so adult level ones, twos, threes, they all now have to assess their own pediatric readiness, and if they have gaps, they have to address them. Well, this provided a lot of motivation for adult trauma centers to start to look into that. So we, we piggybacked on that and used the ACS TQIP communication channels and worked with one of those cross-cutting EIIC domains, the PEC Workforce Development Collaborative, and we reached out and we've been able to train 300 pediatric emergency care coordinators from trauma centers. And this work continues. We are now creating a, a community of practice with peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and onboarding more and more pediatric emergency care coordinators who are boots on the ground in these adult trauma centers that can now address those six domains of pediatric readiness. If there's one thing you can do to improve your pediatric readiness, it's to identify a PEC in your center. So we will continue this work, but at, you know, 300 trauma centers that now have a PEC, that's a big deal. 
Image, imaging, um, you know, I'm partly responsible for this. I don't know if anybody has uh, read this uh, wonderful document from ACST Quip. It's really comprehensive and it's actually really good, but it's 116 pages. Um, nobody reads it, it's too long, okay? Um, I think Barb, you helped me write this too, so she's, you can blame her as well. But we need one-page guides for imaging. These are, this is a PCAR and head injury thing that I think a lot of us use. There are many versions of this, but it's one-page, easy-to-follow algorithm. We need this for C-spine. We need this for chest CTs. We need this for abdominal CTs, whole-body CTs, if any kids should ever get that. There, there are probably a few. But we need better guidance so that the initial adult trauma centers don't pan-scan every kid that comes through that doesn't need it. Our third priority, there are, there are a lot of courses out there for trauma, pediatric trauma, pediatric resuscitation, but people don't use them and they don't maintain certification and, and they may take it and for 10 years they don't refresh or do anything. And we really need to identify what the barriers to better provider training for pediatric trauma resuscitation is. And we need to tailor courses to adult providers, figure out how to best implement them to overcome those barriers and pair it with some just-in-time guides. I don't think we should be treating or, or training adult providers how to take care of kids. I think we should be providing them with just-in-time resources and training them on how to use those resources in real time to resuscitate that 11 kilo kid who needs a massive transfusion. Okay, so pairing the tools with the training. And I think that this impact can be amplified by all of us in this room. If we're all using the same resources that we plan to make available for free, if pediatric trauma centers are using these resources and pushing them out to their referral centers, when we get that intake and that phone call, we can say, you know, look at page six in your flip chart that, that's, that we're using. Look at that and follow that algorithm. We'll get the aircraft on the way, but I want you to start there. So, so we at the pediatric trauma centers need to engage in these regional networks, and we need to allow these adult trauma centers to rely upon us for that initial resuscitative phase so that they can get us the patients in optimal condition. And priority number four is really optimizing the system, trying to figure out how to better improve the system for kids, and this sort of encompasses everything that we're doing. I'm not sure that pediatric readiness alone is enough, but it's a good start. We don't know what a threshold score is, how ready do you really have to be, we're trying to figure that out. And we need a better understanding of how these kids move through the trauma system from a geospatial standpoint, from a data linkage standpoint, from the pre-hospital to the initial receiving hospital, through all of the, the transport modalities and then to the definitive care at Pediatric Trauma Center. We need to better understand that process. But all of this requires coordination, starting with our centers and buy-in from our centers. So um, I'm going to pass the baton off now to uh, Dr. Newton, who's going to talk a little bit more about this regionalized uh, approach uh, to care. Thank you. Okay, good. They got this up. So uh, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I have to say it's just such a humbling, amazing privilege to, to be up here talking about this. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Barksdale for setting up this panel. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, pediatric disaster centers of excellence and, uh, and how some of this evolved and, and hopefully provide a little bit of inspiration about where surgeons as a community fit into all of this network. And I will try my best to be uh, very brief and I just want to give examples uh, so that we can move on to, to um, Dr. Macias and Dr. Fallot's talk. Um, I do have to uh, acknowledge uh, disclosures that is probably true for everybody on this panel. These are federally funded programs. None of us are speaking uh, on behalf of the federal government, however. Okay, so the Pediatric Disaster Centers of Excellence. These are programs that were funded and established in 2019. There are two centers that are, that are um, in the U.S. One is the Great Lakes Consortium. This is Region 5 for Kids now. Um, uh, Dr. Dingeldein is part of that group. Um, the other is the West Coast Alliance. Uh, we affectionately call that RAPM. That's my group, encompassing six states uh, across the West Coast. So I'm not going to go over the gaps of why these were established, because hopefully the, the problems and the gaps are very apparent to everybody in the room. All you have to do is listen to some of the amazing presentations over the past few days. I, uh, and I think Dr. Jensen and Dr. Dangelein did a great job of, of setting this up. I do want to emphasize on this slide, however, this is not a new problem. Uh, there have been advocates for 20 to 30 years um, uh, promoting fixing this problem. There's been a series of multiple programs that have led to this point 
of having these programs and this funding that is now focused on, on trying to fix these problems. And before I talk about some of the details of, of our program and how we got here, uh, I want to take one moment to try to inspire you about why surgeons belong in this space. And maybe to do that, the, the, the best perspective that I can start with is to remind you that a lot of the roots of where our specialty came from started with the disaster in 1917. And there's been over 100 years now of individuals in this community who have stepped in, who have responded, and who are heroes and champions in so many different aspects of, uh, of this space. And the, these pictures are like a, a brief. We could, we could spend the entire lecture uh, talking just about the amazing individuals. The end result of this is really profound experience. And it is a tradition that in my opinion you should be very proud of. All right, so for us, the uh, notice of funding came out in 2019. You can see there was eight weeks to put together a grant proposal, and the scope was everything you can imagine, uh, covering multiple states, uh, states interacting, interjurisdictional. Um, it was frightening and overwhelming, and when I had uh, initial small group discussions, I honestly wasn't sure that we could pull this off. Um, uh, but I had a really strong mentor in Dr. Upperman who encouraged me to keep going with this and helped me a lot. The initial eight weeks of putting this together, I'll be honest, getting a grant of this magnitude on paper, that was the easy part. The tough part was pulling in all the collaborators together into one team. Because there's a lot of people across state lines and next door academic institutions that did not want to work together. And I had to convince them that this was worth it, that this was an opportunity and, and their passions would come together and actually make a difference. And of course, no one wants to work with the state of California. And so I had to get over that. <laughs> and I had to work with people to convince them it's okay. And so I set this up with a few core founding principles to make that happen. Simple, constant communication. This is about combining people's passions and expertise to take advantage of an opportunity that's never been there before. And we're gonna, and we're gonna set a platform where voices are equal and states are equally represented and egos are not part of this. And the focus is on fixing the problem and operations. So we set up the structure like this. I only put this slide up to, uh, to point out the, the breadth of all the niches. We had uh, multiple different small groups working in different areas with expertise across multiple state lines in each of these. I'm not gonna go over all of these. This would be a massive discussion to talk about all of the products and, and programs that, uh, that this group is engaged in. But I wanna give you a few examples so you get an idea of what this is all about. So, um, each of those groups that, uh, that is on that org chart, they have all had their own projects, um, uh, like Dr. Jensen was talking about, the trauma domain, um, uh, trying to figure out systems of care. Um, all of those groups have produced guidelines and white papers and webinars and toolkits and uh, manuals and a whole host of, of products uh, that are available to everyone. Uh, core to our principles, we uh, have made all of this open access. And so many of these things are easily available online. Most of them are now, um, uh, we have given to the federal government to use and disseminate everywhere, not just on the West Coast. I will also note many of these projects were done in combination between our West Coast group and our Great Lakes group. So the two centers have not been working in isolation. We interact on, on almost everything we do. All right, so for the examples, I want to begin here. So we started September 2019. Uh, that was roughly four to five months before the COVID pandemic began. And when it did, we had to pivot in a very dramatic fashion. 
and, um, and switch from prevention and programs and infrastructure to response. And I learned some very deep lessons. This is one example, and uh, this moment came in March of 2020 when throughout the surgical community, there was this unbelievable uncertainty and, um, and anxiety and, and heartbreak and problems that no one had answers to because we didn't have data and there was no way to get evidence and there was no way to really answer so many questions. And so some people got together and said, let's do what we can do and let's set up a community. And um, I put these photos up there because this really was made possible by David Powell. And, uh, and it was brought together by the passion and the champion in Lauren Berman. And there are so many uh, others, uh, many who are here, that, that willingly came forward and used this strange new platform called Zoom to get together and talk about what's going on and what are your best practices. This was not scientific, but it was meaningful. And it was profound. And it is what, at the moment, we all needed. So we are still working on COVID. COVID is not over, in case many of you are, are wondering about that. Many of things coming in the, in the next several months include, if you didn't know, the vaccine for under age five probably will come out next month. That's the timetable, of course, no one knows. Um, uh, however, this is coming in the setting of um, a very high seroprevalence in, in that age group, and there's a lot of uncertainty of what is our community is going to do with this, and, and is the vaccine going to be accepted? There likely will be you know, some kind of wave still coming, and we have to figure out um, uh, how we're going to do, deal with that in terms of staffing and implementing lessons learned over the past two to three years. All right, um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go pretty quick through a couple of other examples. We do have a trauma team and a, and a team looking at uh, deployable strike team pediatric um, uh, groups. Um, uh, one of the products that uh, they are working on right now is called a pediatric disaster life support course. This is theoretically designed to be um, uh, useful for a lot of the things that Dr. Jensen was talking about, engaging community adult hospitals that need focused training on how do I improve our care and our capacity and capabilities for kids. This is not a new course. We did not design this. It's been out there for about 10 to 15 years. However, um, gratitude to uh, uh, UMass who allowed us to uh, uh, take this over and convert this to a modular focused kind of a course. Um, our deployable strike teams have also, and this is attached now to this course, developed a just-in-time manual. This is a guideline. The focus and target group for this is adult providers, not pediatric providers. This, this is there to help those teams who are largely uh, adult emergency medicine you know, practitioners who walk into tents with, with fatigues on and they see a room filled with kids and their anxiety level shoots through the roof. And they asked, how can you help us? And so we put together pearls. This is not gonna make them pediatricians by any stretch of the imagination, but it is intended to help them get by and help them to get through the day um, uh, in a moment when they really need some simple guidance. Um, I'm not going to belabor this uh, either, but mental health in, in our kids has been an overwhelming and heartbreaking problem. Um, it is not over. It did not start with COVID. Um, the resource gaps and the challenges um, uh, started long before COVID uh, arose. Pulling together best practices from around the country is what this group has done. Um, uh, they've done this in multiple uh, domains, screening and prevention and, and intervention. Um, uh, this group has been, has been, I think, so successful. They were invited um, uh, last month and took uh, these products uh, to some of the Poland refugee camps as well and rolled out a train-the-trainer kind of a, a exer exercise for some of the Eastern Bloc countries. Um, once again, I'm not going to go into details, but I do want to acknowledge current events. Yes, there is a very dramatic supply chain problem right now. Um, uh, the uh, formula uh, supply chain issues 
is a major problem, and I promise you no one has a perfect answer, but uh, there's tons of people that are, that are trying to address this as we speak. Um, the other is um, uh, CBRN. Uh, with the beginnings of the, of the conflict in, in Eastern Europe, uh, we were also asked for kids to pull together information about treatment of children for nuclear and biologic and, and chemical events. The countermeasures and the treatments for kids uh, is out there, but it's scattered all over the place in multiple different areas. And so we pulled together a group of experts in poison control centers that are pulling this together in one centralized manual that's easily accessible. Uh, it is almost finished. This will go off and be utilized for um, uh, the federal government as well and will be provided to NATO countries. So I'm not going to get into depth with the um, uh, PEDS Ready project. Uh, uh, Mary will talk further about this, but I do uh, want to make one point. To make all these programs really work, it is heavily dependent on having a hub that is solid. Uh, that is us. That is the children's hospitals that are the core of the expertise that reaches out to, you know, to all of the others. Finally, um, uh, I'm also not going to go into this. This is the next step in the evolution of these programs. This is the Pediatric Pandemic Network. Charles is going to talk more extensively about this. The only thing I want to say about this is this is the ultimate in collaboration. This is the exercise that pulls all of this together and creates a unified national framework and thought about how we progress in the years to come in this space. And, and final words, um, the past two and a half years with COVID have been very hard on all of us. It's been um, uh, exhausting and heartbreaking and challenging in ways that no one anticipated. Um, we are now progressively coming out of this and we stand at a moment where after this, there is unprecedented opportunity. There is a chance here to change the playing field and change the foundations of everything we do and the care for children everywhere. And I encourage you, don't let this moment pass. Look around you, look locally. There are champions in all of these areas, all around you. There are brilliant people in this organization that are doing such amazing work. Um, uh, invest yourself in it and be the hub. Thank you. Uh, Charles. Thank you. Um, so to add to the uh, acknowledgments and disclaimers, just want to add the Emergency Medical Services for Children program funded under MCHB, um, under HRSA, the Regional Pediatric Pandemic Network funded under HRSA, as well as the Pediatric Disaster Centers of Excellence. Uh, we've done due diligence now. All right. So I want to take you back to the concept of pediatric readiness and much of what you thought, because this is the underpinnings for pediatric disaster management and for pediatric uh, preparedness. But I would ask you that you now consider what you've heard through the lens of what the public and what legislators see, because this is what it takes to make big scale change. And we start with the concept that to be pediatric ready, we understand that there are going to be pockets of excellence where these gaps in geography, whether I take a map that looks at population density, whether I overlay that with trauma centers, overlay that with uh, institutions that have pediatric surgeons, institutions that have pediatric uh, emergency medicine physicians, the gap in equity related to geography remains one of the biggest deterrents to timely emergent care, whether every day or in a disaster. Um, and it is not a surprise that with 75% of our healthcare systems focused on adult medicine, that 25% often is not optimized to deliver the best outcomes possible. Uh, and as Aaron has pointed out earlier, to be pediatric ready in a disaster, you've got to be uh, 
pediatric ready on a random Tuesday. So does that hold out for the lessons that we've learned over the many years of disasters? Well, we currently know from literature around the National Pediatric Readiness Project as well as surveys from the um, AHA that fewer than 50% uh, percent of hospitals that are pediatric trauma centers have addressed surgical and medical needs of children within their disaster plans. That number drops down to less than a quarter of trauma centers when you talk about level four trauma centers. Our lessons learned have then manifested everything that you've heard previously about school shootings, bombings, other mass casualty incidents, and to make the point, uh, to stress the point that Mike made earlier, disasters are more every day than they are uh, known to be rare. And when we really aggregate the total impact, it's an impact not just in dollars, but in lives lost. And that captures the attention of legislators. So it's uh, no surprise that in the early 2000s, uh, what Mike referred to earlier from the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, that described this unevenness in our ability to deliver the care for children when they need it emergently uh, has manifested even a decade later. This is from the National Commission on Children and Disasters, a decade after that Institute of Medicine report that points out that programs and practices for managing disasters are fragmented and unaccountable to children. So with that lens and with the knowledge that what was emerging with now fast forward to a decade, uh, the COVID pandemic, we were beginning to see in real time the manifestation of everything you just heard about but touching the public and touching our legislators. That we were seeing more and more stories about the disparate access to resources that were uh, exacerbating inequities in care and outcomes of care. Whether that's from canceled surgical procedures that were uneven across institutions, from exacerbations of chronic illness because of uh, access to management in either emergency departments or primary care physician offices, from our nascency in learning e-health systems, patient monitoring electronically or telehealth, uh, or whether that's gaps in community engagement because we had widely variable management of the way that we were masking it and providing vaccines, engaging our community partners, faith-based organizations, schools, really depended where you were as to what your children were gonna be asked to do. All of this uh, coupled with what we know to be the growing problems of behavioral health, as you heard, uh, an increase of 35% in the number of behavioral health emergency department visits across the nation with an increase in suicidal ideation, a feeling of exacerbation and isolation in most children that was uh, coupling with their chronic illnesses. Um, when you look at the reports that describe a 48% decrease during the peak of the pandemic in the number of uh, canceled, I'm sorry, 48% uh, number of canceled pediatric surgeries during the peak of the pandemic, and you hear in those same re uh, reports that we look back uh, after the pandemic to numbers that exceeded 2019, I would ask that we not think about that in quantity, but in quality. Because at the same time that we were uh, experiencing an expectation to rebound, we were seeing the attrition of 1.5 million healthcare workers. The people, EMTs, paramedics that are trying to deliver ill and injured children to emergent care settings, the people that were manning the operating rooms, the emergency departments, this putting very big stressors on our workforce and our system. That is what Congress saw. So it's no surprise that they funded the Pediatric Pandemic Network in September of 2021. Uh, this came from the Health Services Resources and Services Administration, a $48 million investment over five years under the guidance of this uh, SPRANS, the Special Projects of Regional and National Significance. And that pandemic network brought together all of the networks that you previously heard about, the two ASPR Centers of Excellence, the Emergency Medical Services for Children Innovation and Improvement Center, uh, and five hub hospitals, Rainbow Babies, Cardinal Glennon in St. Louis, Benioff Children's in San Francisco, Primary Children's in Salt Lake, and Norton Children's um, in Louisville. Combining all these efforts created a network of 27 institutions funded by the pandemic network across 15 states. 
Consider, though, the empowerment of each of those networks in integrating with the Emergency Medical Services of Children state partnerships that now puts a footprint in 58 state partnership programs in 58 states and territories. So the capability to build a structure that could accommodate the new processes that need to be in place uh, were tremendous. PPN's mission, to leverage the resources and expertise of the children's hospital, not to enhance the capabilities there at the children's hospitals, but to think outside in. How can we leverage children's hospitals to build their communities for readiness? Schools, coalitions, government entities. Um, and that became the mission and vision. So the high-level goals that really speak to the key drivers are building collaborations and partnerships with the children's hospitals and community entities, improving pediatric readiness across all healthcare systems, increasing the capacity and capability of telehealth to provide improved access to care, and accelerating real-time dissemination and uptake of uh, easily digestible uh, research-informed pediatric care. So we operate in the 19 domains that you just heard about with four categories of pediatric readiness. Access to care with a heavy emphasis on telehealth, uh, and mind you, each of these represents uh, national task forces. Uh, everyday readiness with an emphasis on trauma burns and MCI led by Dr. Fallett um, and the team that you see here before you. Disaster preparedness, um, driving much of the care around deployable assets uh, determinations and quality improvement fundamentals. I wanna take a moment to really talk about the quality improvement piece and the pediatric disaster readiness because if we're gonna make healthcare systems ready, they have to be ready across the entire continuum, meaning an engagement in pre-hospital care and expanding community support outside of the walls, four walls of the hospital, into preparedness and prevention in our communities. Um, why do we do that? Because over 80% of children with acute injuries and emergencies don't present to children's hospitals. They present to our communities. So that's the scope that we really need to focus. And every day readiness begins with many of the structured programs that we could already leverage. I just want to deep dive a bit into the National Pediatric Readiness Project because there's a lot that we've learned from about the 10-year intervals that we've surveyed the over 4,000 uh, nations hospital EDs to understand um, the ability to care for kids. The last assessment with complete analysis was uh, completed in 2013. The most recent uh, survey was recently closed and that analysis is currently underway. Um, but what we do know is that higher pediatric readiness scores correlate to improved mortality. So if you're a hospital that scores in the top quartile of national pediatric readiness scores, you have one-fourth the mortality uh, of the remainder of the group for children that are critically ill. And that application of improved outcomes is true for trauma centers at, as well. And you see that association with uh, mortality um, on the uh, y-axis and pediatric readiness score um, on the x-axis. So it really uh, begs the question, then, what structural improvements can we make that will make institutions more pediatric readiness? And what do we know from the literature? You heard the description of pediatric emergency care coordinators, um, which are not necessarily fully funded people, but people empowered by a hospital uh, to support pediatric initiatives, uh, as well as facility recognition programs. And we have to imbue all of this into our existing infrastructures. You see there on the right, uh, the association with um, ACS trauma designation and the need to, uh, for recognition to define um, your pediatric readiness score and have a plan to bridge that gap. But we see that progress as we move the 10-year survey into a continuous survey beginning in the next two years for hospitals to have an ongoing ability to understand uh, their pediatric readiness. And finally, we're moving into pre-hospitals with the pre-hospital pediatric readiness project to address pre-hospital readiness for children in the nation's over 17,000 pre-hospital agencies. So all of this with a foundation of improvement science, analytics, uh, sophisticated education that isn't just delivered to providers, but it's delivered to legislators, to the lay public in digestible forms uh, that allows for just-in-time training or just-in-time information. We do a number of uh, team support efforts through collaboratives, quality improvement collaboratives, not unlike TQIP. And what you see are early successes there on the right with improving community disaster readiness scores over a very short period of time. 
through engaging in these collaboratives. There are a number of collaboratives that we have ongoing, but the one that I would point out, two that I would point out, Pediatric Emergency Care Coordinator Training Workforce Development um, with over 1,500 participants uh, currently, um, and that is over 17 countries. We never expected the wildfire of participation to go outside of this country, uh, but there's a tremendous engagement in understanding uh, what capability and capacity building could look like in other countries as well. And the second is our disaster networking collaborative that begins where you see uh, CEPR RPPN September 1st of this year to December 30th, because here's where we do our coalition building, building our communities, and it takes experts like you to be bridging with our communities to help them understand how they can improve their infrastructure. So in this final slide, just want to describe where we're headed. Every day we're producing new materials and exercises. We're integrating EMS into our pediatric disaster responses. We're creating a national uh, pediatric disaster research agenda that doesn't currently exist, incorporating telehealth into our state and regional disasters. Uh, for our surgical services, developing a national surgical emergency management surge template, um, and creating models for pediatric care coordinating centers that can recognize where skills are, where capacity is. That currently doesn't exist. Often depends on phone calls, often depends on day-old or month-old uh, data across systems. So what can you do? Strengthen your communities, join our collaboratives, uh, engage your institutions in our drills and exercises through simulation, a number of these on MCIs. Identify and support PECs uh, and access and disseminating our tools. You know, individually, we change our outcomes every day with our patients, but collectively, we can advocate and execute on making the nation's entire healthcare system more pediatric ready and disaster ready. Thank you. Okay, I know we got started a little bit late. Um, and this will take us to the top of the hour. And so I'm sure that our panel will uh, be willing to stay a few minutes. And those of you who need a break, we understand. Um, I am not going to continue the conversation on this. I'm going to try to bring it home for us as APSA members so that it helps you understand where we need to be. You'll recognize this scene as Field of Dreams. 1989, it was a movie. It's called Closing the Loop. They're trying to raise $50 million. Boy, what could we do with that to build a $3,000 baseball stadium on this scene? Breaking boundaries. How many have seen this? David Attenborough. There are nine limits to our planet. We've raced past four of them. Climate change, deforestation. We just went through a pandemic. We have more and more forest fires because of drought. We have more floods in the southeast because of deforestation. We have more hurricanes. Kentucky just had a tornado, so I got to do some on-the-job training. This isn't going to end, partly because of us. We have artificial boundaries that we've created by virtue of where we work and practice because we need to be able to practice within our scope and have the resources we need. So in the upper left, that's where we work, where the dense green areas are. And we aren't often in the places that are white. On the right is where the level one and two pediatric trauma centers are. And on the bottom is where our anesthesia colleagues practice. They overlap. There are vast parts of this country where we don't work. This is a very popular show. How many watch it? Um, it talks about rural America. We've been talking about this for three days now. In rural America are 20% of the population. Nearly a quarter are kids. 15.7% of them live in poverty, and a quarter of them don't even have access to the internet, so I'm not sure how we expect them to have telehealth services. On the right are the states of rural America, dark green, there's 15 of them, one of them is my state, are the most densely populated rural, or, or the, are the most rural states. Half of my state's in Appalachia. Um, on the left is the population under 18 in poverty by county. If you're dark purple, it's an urban area. 
If you're dark green, it's a rural area, and that's greater than 30% of the kids under 18 living in poverty. Rural hospitals are an integral part of our healthcare system, but many of them are closing because of finances. They see very few children, and so the infrastructure isn't there for them to really take care or appreciate the importance of taking care of kids. That's not where they're going to put their money. The most important part of this slide is in the right upper side where you look at 1970 when Nixon launched the war on drugs, and then you look at the incarceration in our prisons. Orange is state, lighter orange is local, yellow is federal. Um, this has contributed to incarceration of our dads and our moms. We heard Brian Stevenson talk about the statistics on the left that I added to the slide. Um, these are our patients, and they have a hard time getting to us if it's a single mom. They don't have gas, and it's more expensive to get gas. They have to wait till they get paid so that they can drive to see us. So we have to be there for them. Access to care. Probably several of you noticed I broke my wing. May 1st, I fell. About 10 hours later, I said, okay, it's really broken. I called the emergency department. I said, who's on call for hand surgery? I called the number. I thought about doing number two for patients, but instead I chose number one for doctors and providers. I talked to the hand surgeon who was scrubbed. I said, I think I broke my wrist. He said, I'll see you at 8.15 tomorrow morning before my other patients. And on Tuesday, two days later, I was in the operating room having an ORIF. So I got great access to care, didn't I? But my patients don't get the same access to care. Now, ethically, you could say, okay, I take care of children. This gets me back to work quicker. So perhaps you can justify it, but it's different. Um, we're different. Here's where the level one and two centers are, adult and pediatric in our country. Here's where the level three and fours are. Look at the opportunity that we have to reach those emergency departments where we don't practice. Recently, several of you participated in a trauma survey that we deployed through APSA. So far, we have 272 respondents, 94% full-time, 94% work in a verified trauma center, 29% are trauma directors, 90% admit their own patients, 16% take in-house call, 20% get a trauma stipend. I'm missing these states. At the bottom, you'll see my email address and that of my ABLE assistant, Amelia Rogers. Please, if you haven't participated, I'd love for you to participate, even if you don't take care of trauma uh, patients, because I'd like to get a little more of a visual. Many of, this, of the surgeons taking care of trauma patients are double boarded in general surgery and pediatric surgery. Surgical critical care is number three there. They work in freestanding children's hospitals, children's hospitals within a hospital, and then the third is mixed adult and pediatric. Um, this is how many licensed beds are in your hospital, and they range from less than 100 to more than 1,000. David Richardson, who unfortunately passed away last year, did an important study in 1992 looking at finishing surgery residents in their country, in this country, and their enthusiasm about taking care of trauma after they left their surgical residency. And basically, there wasn't much enthusiasm. And that's why acute care surgery was born. Heavy amount of night work detracts from the elective schedule, poor reimbursement. Um, I asked the question, are you a current member of the following organizations? Top is AAST, second is PTS, third is East, fourth is West. Pediatric Trauma Society has the um, highest number of penetration of pediatric surgeons. The lowest bar is not a member. So most people who take care, most of us who take care of trauma patients are not a member of one of these organizations. And the reason is they're not interested in trauma. They take care of trauma patients because it's part of their job. They do it well, but they're really not interested in it. So let's break some bad boundaries. First thing is I'm proud that the American College of Surgeons stepped up to the plate and said, okay, we're ready to recognize that pedi pediatric readiness is important. 
um, as of fall of 2023, any verified trauma center by the college has to meet this standard. What does the standard mean? It means that the emergency department must evaluate its pediatric readiness and have a plan to address any deficiencies. It's a type two criterion deficiency. If you have three or less of these, you can still pass. Um, and so it's a weaker criterion deficiency, but there's lots of resources that will be available to people um, to meet the standard. Um, and again, I, I think that this is a move forward. So let's talk about access to children's surgical care. Um, surgeons are not gonna go to the emergency department and do the checklist for pediatric readiness, but we need to be part of the team. We need to know what it means. We need to have engagement. We need to work with our emergency providers, and we need to help adult surgeons and trauma surgeons know that it's something that's important. A few years ago, I did this survey looking at gaps in pediatric surgical care by rural surgeons. Uh, the fact is that the rural surgeons who trained when I trained and do pediatric cases are retiring. They have no succession plan. The anesthesiologist who put their kids to sleep are retiring. They have no succession plan. And so there's a generation now of surgeons in rural America who really don't want to take care of kids and they don't have the infrastructure to do that. And I wasn't here, but I heard um, Sarah or Hannah talk about this yesterday, and, and she appealed to the CSB program of the college to um, provide standards for rural hospitals. And the problem is, just what I said before, they don't have the money, and they don't see enough kids. Um, and so yes, maybe we as the American College of Surgeons need to come up with a way, a pathway forward for that, but I think level three verification for those hospitals is in the distant future. Um, I also participated in this study looking at general surgery resident training and the amount of pediatric surgery they do, what year it's done in. Um, in, in the bottom line is many of the places who have pediatric surgery rotations do them as a lower level resident. So they forget it. They don't, they don't know it um, when they leave their residency. And if we want to change that, those who are going into a rural track in general surgery re really need to have that as a mandatory part of their curriculum during R4 or R5, not during R2 or 3. So the Right Child, Right Surgeon Initiative is something that John Waldhausen um, championed when he was president, and Sam Alash wrote this paper. There's many um, editorial comments towards the end of it. Um, but um, out of this was born a task force, which I led, which has now morphed to a committee. So if you were here this morning for the business meeting, we voted to make this a committee. Um, and it has three prongs, and Jonathan Kohler is the chair now. And, my, uh, and we have a vision and a mission to improve surgical care for children in communities that lack specialists and to develop systems of care that can enable these children to get where they need to go. Um, so we have three things, engagement, gap analysis, and knowledge sharing. Um, I'm working on engagement with um, the program directors in general surgery, with the acute care surgery training program to enable them to have pediatrics in their curriculum. Um, we're working with um, the emergency medicine workforce to um, try to engage them to look at where the emergency medicine providers work and support these efforts. Um, I joined the Nor Northern Plains Rural Surgical Society. I've been twice to talk about pediatrics in their environment. They're interested, they wanna be involved in this. Um, and Ken Gao is working with the American Academy of Pediatrics and all the specialty services um, to look at where um, subspecialists in pediatrics practice. He got, who knew it, an Amazon grant to do this. Um, and then we'll do some geo mapping to see where we aren't. And then Jonathan Kohler is leading the telehealth and outreach ed education. Um, where he's trying to determine where the greatest need is, what rural surgeons want to hear about, um, and develop um, a, a program where they can get this information. 
Um, the Education Committee solicited in, in, advice from the military surgeons, the Advisory Council for Rural Surgery um, in various countries, and identified three levels of training that could, um, could benefit from a curriculum. They've developed a pediatric surgery curriculum for those who don't practice pediatric surgery aimed at critical access hospitals, remote community hospitals, and then the deployed or humanitarian environment. Um, this is led by Mary Edwards. Um, it's a great effort. Right now they're working on appendicitis, which was the highest area of interest, and their second area of interest will be trauma. Um, I just uh, call your attention to this um, uh, manual that was released in 2016 by NASEM, used to be the IOM, um, talking about the integration of military and civilian trauma. Um, it is something that includes pediatrics. Um, it's being discussed at the federal level for funding. Um, hopefully that will also be funded. Um, but two weeks ago, I had the privilege of speaking at the Northwest States Trauma Conference. Um, and there was a very nice presentation by Jennifer Gurney about military principles for, tra for triage. And I put them up here for you to look at. And I thought, oh my god, that's surgery M&M. We debrief, we process, we look for opportunities for improvement, we try to bring balance to the discussion, and we strive to do better. So we know what this is all about. We just need to translate it to a different arena. So EMS for Children is a program that emphasizes emergency care for children. I've been part of that program since 2004 as the program director in Kentucky. Somewhere around 40% of what we do every day as pediatric surgeons is emergencies. So it's important to us. Children enter emergency departments all over this country that are currently ill-equipped to take care of their emergencies. And it's easy for us to criticize when we get someone in bad condition. Um, it's harder for us to communicate effectively and say, hey, this is how you could do it the next time to enhance that child's ability to get to us safer. Or you could pick up the phone and call us and we'll help you understand how to get that child to us safely. So we as pediatric surgeons should direct the future of children's surgery care, surgery care. I see a lot of opportunity in this room, and I've heard about it in the last few days. But we have to work outside of our silo of comfort as pediatric surgeons, together with our adult and pediatric colleagues, to accomplish this. And we should communicate and educate to extend our outreach to rural and underserved hospitals. And please understand, embrace, and promulgate pediatric readiness. This is the first way to raise all boats. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I think uh, we still have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has questions. Hey, guys. Is this on? Hey, Shannon Castle, Valley Children's in Central California. Um, you know, from uh, you guys all kind of alluded to this idea of training the referral hospitals or the level threes or fours or critical access. When you're looking at a system, you know, I overlap uh, kind of transfer areas with Chris and Aaron. If you're looking for an actionable item, say this week, this month, do you guys think the biggest bang for your buck is to do kind of more global education and try to get, say, an app or the websites to all of those emergency physicians? Or is it identifying a person at each one of those to be the PEDS champion, more of a pyramidal thing if you're looking at a, a small action kind of for this month, say? Yeah, and um, I'm so sorry, Shannon. It's, I got to admit, it's, it's really hard up, up at the podium to, to hear the questions. But I think I, think I understood what you're after. And, uh, and the core of your question, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, is is the goal here to create a, a, the PAC, the champion in each of the emergency rooms, or um, a diffuse education and train all ER docs? Did, did I say that right? Correct. Or, or obviously the goal is to do both, I would think. But how do you see if someone has limited resources? Like, what should I be doing this month to help you and Aaron try to get, you know, our sister hospitals? 
Yeah, and, and in the circumstance you're talking about, so limited resources, this, I think it's a multi-step process. Um, and step one is, um, uh, is having the coordinator and the champion in the hospital um, uh, that can help evolve their system. Step two is being connected with you know, the children's hospital that you're going to, that's gonna mentor you through things. Ultimately, yes, you're gonna need to elevate the capabilities of the whole hospital. It's not just the champion that can do that. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. I'll follow up on that. I, I, I don't think education alone is enough. Um, yeah. <coughs> you, you can't train people and then have them not take care of kids on a regular basis and then expect them to learn. Um, I, I think getting tools, just-in-time guides in their hands that, that are robust, that are being used nationally, is ultimately going to be the most important thing, and training people how to use those tools. Um, I don't think every center in this room needs to be creating their own tools. We are doing that. Uh, and we're really close to having those standardized, you know, one-page templates for who should get a belly CT after trauma. And, and we at the EISC are going to make those freely available to everybody. So we're trying to do that work to make it easier for all of the regional really? centers. But I would say right now, if there's one thing you can do, it's encourage all of your referral centers to identify a PEC to have one person there who is identified as the pediatric champion. So as these resources become available, you can push them out and you have a, you have a grassroots implementation plan uh, to get things out. So, so I would focus on PECs right now uh, because once we have that network and we have a way into those EDs, um, we, we can incite big time change. Can, can, let me add one thing. Yeah. I just wanted to add, well, just wanted to add one thing to, um, to what Aaron just said, and that is, in the world of qual uh, quality improvement, when we look at error reduction, we know that education will get us to 80, a uh, little over above 80% error reduction. When we hardwire solutions, our reliability goes up to 99%. So the ability to, to move beyond just educating the providers uh, or putting a PEC in means that we've got to create all the hardwiring through infrastructure change, equipment supplies, personnel, ongoing training, testing systems, simulation. It's all of the scope of the work of a PEC. It's really surprising to me to, that when I talk to people at referring centers that they don't realize that the back of the Braslow tape has like drug dosing and tube sizes and like they think that the tape is really just to estimate a weight and you're done. And, and when you actually train them how to use the tape, they're like, wow, this is revolutionary. And this thing's been around for decades, right? And people just don't even realize that this, this is a very sophisticated tool that's in your hands that if you just knew how to use it, you'd be such a better provider for resuscitating pediatric trauma patients. So, so that's a, a very simple model for, for our vision, which is put things in people's hands and teach them how to use them so that they can rely on those aids when they're in the moment, when they're in the disaster, when it's Tuesday morning and they haven't taken care of a kid for four months or four years. We, we need these tools and we need to teach people how to use them and they need to be free and we all need to be using the same tools so we're all given the same message and that we're all on the same page with a shared mental model. Thanks, Seth. I think uh, Dr. Stoller, I think I saw you get up next. Yeah, thank you, yeah, Stoller, Santa Barbara. Um, just a common perspective and a, and a suggestion, I guess. The, the common perspective is when I moved from a very successful pediatric trauma program led by Steve Stilianos at the Columbia to Central California, which is a largely rural area, which is a few hours north of here, um, they asked us to develop a pediatric trauma program as a part of the adult program. And the issues that we ran here, so I developed how to do it, uh, here's the business plan, here's what it's going to cost, here's the deliverables, and it was dead on arrival. Why? Because the hospital did not want to put any money into it. As my old chief used to say, if you're not getting paid, it's just a hobby. Uh, so there was a cost to this, nurses, physicians, and the other thing we ran into is the adult surgeons doing pediatric trauma did not want to share the, re the support that they got from the hospital. So when you talk about how it's all of us can be motivated to develop pediatric resources, rural and wherever, part of our target has to be the administration, people that are writing the checks or actually to develop the support. So I encourage you, if you're working in these environments, that's who you have to work with. There's uh, some substantial obstacles around allocation of, of resources, number one. Number two, unrelated, that I was li listening to the discussion about helicoptering that, that uh, baby that came out of the front loader. Um, telemedicine that's been emerged dramatically from COVID is a major resource. 
You know, one of the major providers of uh, telemedicine robots is actually in Santa Barbara, in Touch Medical. They do the, I think anybody here from Mayo, they know about this a lot. And we've used these robots placed in remote areas around Santa Barbara. They'll call us, they have a newborn with thus and such, they have a kid with a trauma of thus and such. We're on call, they find us, and we can telemedicine, through telemedicine, guide the initial resuscitation. This is the size of endotracheal to put in. This is how you put an IO in. Um, this is the medicines you ought to give. The helicopters on the way. So if you don't have access to this, I encourage you to explore telemedicine as a very potent tool, not just for elective consultation, but for guiding initial resuscitation for trauma patients. Thank you. Up front. Yeah, Sid Johnson, University of Hawaii. Um, you know, I, I just want to ask your advice. I feel that in our state, as is, is in our, my group of surgeons advocates in our state, we're kind of torn. On the one hand, we're advocating to be the children's hospital for Hawaii. On the other hand, sort of like Dr. Stoller just mentioned, um, we're pushing for a trauma system. And um, I'm torn because I keep pleading for pediatric subspecialization. The flip side is, is, is our adult center, we have one level one. As they build their system, they keep wanting pediatric support. So <clears throat> they just bought a bunch of hospitalists, pediatric hospitalists. I have two pediatric gastroenterologists in our state. The adult hospital asked me, told me they're posting for a pediatric gastroenterology job because they're trying to build their pediatric services and here we're trying to build a, a center, a verified center in pediatric excellence. And I'm really torn between the trauma system build and our pediatric excellence. And I'm asking for advice as to how you might walk that line. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure that I can offer you a, a perfect solution, but um, I, I think to have the pediatric system, you need the pediatric hub. And, and you have to start with a center that has uh, expertise and excellence before you can really develop the rest of your the rest of your programs. Now you're going to run into the same problems that Dr. Stoller was talking about, and he's absolutely right. You know the the integration of the flow of funds through the adult system to make them participate in all of the pediatric system. It's a tough argument, and and I don't want to belittle that, but this is I think what you have to work through. Uh, Romy Ignacio, San Diego. Again, thanks for a great panel. This is timely for me because I'm trying to address issues not only at San Diego County, not in Imperial Valley, but also across the border. And when I have these discussions, I have, the problem I have is the simple answer is I don't take care of kids. Is there a guideline or a structured way to assess the needs of level three, level four, or across the border? Because I'm glad that you're going to share tools that are free. I think that's number one. But number two, I don't know how to focus where my attention should be to get more bang for my buck. I don't know about across the board. I, I get, you're, it sounds like you're asking, is there a way to quantify how many kids are taken care of at this No, center? what I'm asking for is a way, is there a structured method that you guys have learned where I can talk to a level three and level four and say, because I ask them, what's your needs? It's very vague, like we don't take care of kids. Well, that doesn't help me. I'm trying to figure out from your experience of how to uh, assess their needs in sort of structured and organized fashion so that I can take care of their pediatric trauma patients in a more efficient manner. Romeo, you, you could potentially start by working through the um, COT chapter of the ACS. Um, and so I would think that those trauma centers would be represented on that committee, but the other way is to look at the Trauma Advisory Committee for that part of California and see if you can get on their agenda to begin to dialogue about this. That's for me next month. <laughs> Thanks. Dr. Upperman. Upperman Vanderbilt. Upperman Vanderbilt. <laughs> uh, full disclosure, I'm a member of the National Advisory Committee on Disasters, but I am speaking on behalf of Jeff Upperman in this space right now. <laughs> and so as a citizen, I ask these uh, august uh, gathering of uh, 
pediatric trauma disaster leaders, if you were to go to your federal partner or government or representative, uh, I'd like each of you to tell me what would be, and let's just imagine a budget wasn't the issue, what would be your top priority and how much would it take? Thank you. If budget wasn't a priority, you said? <laughs> it's not a priority. You say, I need fill in the blank to do. I think probably one of the top things is just some sort of uh, federal stipend to make sure that providers at all levels, whether it's the surgeon, the ER doc, the PA, whoever it is, is getting adequately funded to do their job and to be educated to do their job. So that's my answer. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I would try, I mean, I, I think they have funded a lot of this and, and, and I would pay for a lot of these just-in-time guides, but also, you need some, you know, I like that Dr. Stoller's idea of, of, of the robots in telemedicine, but you, but you need a human on the other side of that robot who's not getting paid to sit there and wait for the phone to ring. So if we're going to have systems that rely on telemedicine, you have to have availability of consultants. I think we need availability of people to go out into the field and do this training to teach people how to take care of these kids. All, all of this costs money, and it, it would cost a lot. I don't know what the budget is, but um, yeah, I think there needs to be more investment in, in, in pediatric readiness. I mean, what we're doing, really, I mean, they've invested, and that's the work that we're doing. Um, but it, it does cost money to get people out of the operating room and out of taking care of patients out there preparing people how to take care of these kids. Yeah, and, and, and I guess I would, I would echo, you know, one sentiment that Aaron just said, the, you know, my ask and the dream of the funding um, is here. Yep. They just did it. And, and there's people that have, been, that have been advocating for this for a long, long time, and here it is. Now, within this budget and within this packet, there's multiple small things that need more. And um, uh, equity to access and uh, advocating for interstate licensure reciprocity and CMS reciprocity and all of the systems that were implemented over the past two and a half years to protect inequities in, in COVID access. You know, those need to be maintained as all of the crisis standards come down. There's multiple, so many, little projects that need attention. But I'm, I'm grateful for the big package. I would envision the ability to support, as public health workers, a core of pediatric care coordinators across the nation embedded um, with that support link of government, but uh, placed into institutions so that the community partnerships would empower all of this work. What we need more than anything is more than five, more than uh, 1,600 voices. Uh, we need a legion of soldiers who really are gonna carry forth this mission about the importance of pediatric readiness. This may sound a little bit um, parochial, but I, I think, Jeff, that um, when adults get in the room and talk about their missions and visions, they don't include kids. And when we get in the room and talk about our mission and visions, we don't talk about adults. And there needs to be a merger of these two groups of people to say it's all of us, it's not just the kids, it's not just the adults. Um, because whatever hat we're wearing, when we go to a meeting, um, I may be wearing an EMS hat, and I'm there representing EMS, but nobody recognizes me as a children's provider unless I say, what about the kids? Right. So we have to make sure that we're talking about the populace. Children need to be in, embedded in a trauma system in every state, not just in the children's hospitals, in the whole system of care. And we're not sending that message right now. Dr. Stoller? Uh, not to, uh, I'm not here to be a shill for, uh, for telemedicine, but I want to respond to something you said, Aaron. Yeah. Um, for telemedicine for trauma or any of this stuff does require somebody on the other end. And because one of the other thing, good things, to the extent there are good things that have come from COVID, is the CPT codes for uh, telemedicine consults are, are active. They're viable, they're active. There's both professional fees and hospital um, facility fees associated with this. 
And again, I use the Mayo Clinic as a prime example, and our own examples, you know, resuscitating uh, potential stroke patients, trauma patients, newborns. You do need someone on the other end. It requires, you know, a system to set that up. But because uh, it does generate revenue, you can often develop this and sell that to your hospital. Thank you. We're just going to take a five-minute break. If everyone can just please do another hand of, a round of applause for these awesome speakers. I'm sure they'll be available to talk to you guys with more questions. We're going to start in five minutes with the next session. Thanks.